Do we have Hajer? Yes. yes. Can you oh, great. It's, the floor is yours. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. And thank you very much for you and women for inviting me. I think when we discuss women's participation in decision-making processes, be it in politics, be it in the private sector, being it at the household as well, um, it is important to always emphasize that women's participation is a right. Um, it's not something that it's given to us. Um, it's not something extra. Um, it is our right as women and young women to participate in every decision-making process that affects our daily life at whatever level it is. Um, when we look at where we are today, when it comes to women's participation and decision-making processes, maybe one important thing to highlight is that the fact that women are not equally participating, it doesn't say less about us as women and young women. In fact, it says less about the decision-making processes themselves in the sense that since Beijing until now, these decision-making processes has not changed significantly for better. And one important thing also to highlight is that perhaps there is a huge misconception in many parts of the world that these decision-making processes are merit-based, um, that the selection to be part of these decision-making processes are solely merit-based. And this excludes one of the reasons for why women are not able to participate or are not equally participating as men, which is privilege. Um, being born with a within a specific group um, and being born as a specific gender who has a track record of participating and, and leading and designing decision-making processes means that these processes do not really reflect and they do not frankly look like the communities they represent. And every time I'm having a conversation with whoever it is regardless of gender and I say well in order for us women and young women to be able to participate we need, to, we need to have enabling systematic mechanisms. It can be quotas, it can be reserved seats, it can be whatever mechanism it is, but we need to have enabling mechanisms in order to overcome the structural problem. Because the fact that we're not participating easily, equally as men, that's not our fault, it's the fault of the system in itself. And you know, sometimes when you engage in such conversation and you put forward such argument, the opposite and the counter argument will say, well, the law does not prevent you from participating. So why don't you go and run for an office? Why don't you start your company? Why don't you just as a woman or as a young woman simply go and participate? And my response to that is that decision-making processes are like borders. If you don't hold the privileged passport or if you don't belong to a privileged group, it doesn't mean you can easily enter. And telling women to, you know, just go and participate as if there is no structural um, obstacles is as telling me, a, a Libyan person, to just book a ticket and travel the world. I would need a visa to go almost everywhere and to be able to enter any country. I cannot just show up at the border control and say, well, I, I want to get in. And the same argument applies to women and young women's participation and decision-making processes. We still do need a visa to enter these processes. And this visa, it can be a quota, it can be a reserved seat, it can be whatever it is, but the fact is we still need this visa to enter these processes. Thank you, Hajer. I really like the metaphor that you use there about having a visa to enter these processes. Um, I, I think we all on this panel can relate to what you're saying. Uh, I was just mentioning that 30 years ago, I had my first job out of college in which I edited photos of one of our panelists, Rigoberta Menchu today. And if you had asked me at that time, um, if 30 years later, would I be struggling with the issue of gender equality coming from a privileged position, um, as they say, well-educated, um, access to opportunities in the US, 
I would have said, no way, we have an equal playing field. But what I have learned in my three decades of working and experience is it's not an equal playing field. And one thing I want to do going forward is not try to tell a younger generation that it's equal and that if you just work hard, you'll get there because I now know that that is not the truth. Um, I've learned it myself and I've also learned um, about the unconscious bias that, that comes from being in such a position of privilege. Uh, I would love to, to ask now of Beatrice Arhimon, the vice president of Uruguay, um, about your experience of leadership and uh, whether what Hajer is saying resonates for you. Bueno, primero, eh, permítanme agradecer la invitación a formar parte de este, de este momento tan importante que estamos llevando adelante todas juntas. Este encuentro en épocas tan difíciles del, de la sociedad global que, que nos encuentra unidas. Y esto tiene que ver con, con una reflexión y con algo que tú mencionabas. Pero primero, por supuesto, y como corresponde, agradecer a los gobiernos que han organizado este evento y a ONU, que cumple un, un rol importantísimo en hacer visible el tema de la equidad de género desde hace mucho tiempo. Y agradezco este diálogo intergeneracional, porque cuando hablamos de Beijing, cuando hablamos de lo transitado como, como comunidades en este mundo diverso, hay algo que está claro, y es que todas somos conscientes de que se han verificado estudios por demás suficientes de Beijing a hoy, de lo que significa la discriminación en todos los ámbitos. Por lo tanto, yo no voy a hacer hincapié en los minutos que tengo en lo que para nosotras está claro. Hay claras señales de discriminación en nuestras sociedades que se van a agudizar sin lugar a dudas en el escenario de la pospandemia. Entonces, yo no me voy a detener en diagnósticos que ya sabemos, con los que contamos y que forman parte de estudios específicos que nos permiten visualizar lo que a nivel global, con distintas realidades, pero es notorio. Ha habido avances pero se ha demorado mucho, desde mi perspectiva, en obtener esa equidad de género que hace tiempo nosotros señalamos que es un tema no de lucha entre hombres y mujeres como muchos o muchas quieren hacer, poner en, en el escenario. Esto se trata, y desde ahí, me parece que tenemos que estar juntas en estos tiempos, además de ser un tema de derechos, es un tema de calidad de las democracias. Si la mitad o la mirada de la mitad de una población mundial está fuera de donde se decide el futuro de nuestros países, este pasa a ser un tema de calidad de democracia. Y por lo tanto, cuando hablamos de los obstáculos que tenemos, cuando hablamos de ese cambio cultural por el que estamos transitando, no debemos perder de vista que han pasado ya muchos años en que hemos ido denunciando esta realidad y que en el mundo globalizado, donde todo es más rápido, las que ya tenemos años transitando en nuestro rol de esa apertura a mujeres líderes, debemos también dejar claro 
que debemos llevar adelante acciones concretas más rápido. Yo provengo de un sistema político muy sólido, aquí en Uruguay las mujeres tuvimos desde el punto de vista normativo muy tempranamente nuestros derechos, pero sin embargo es verdad que tenemos los mismos obstáculos que hace muchos años íbamos señalando. ¿Que hay avances? Sí lo ha habido. Pero el siglo XXI debió habernos encontrado con una sociedad mucho más equitativa y encontrarnos a las mujeres trasladando nuestra mirada y proporcionando también acciones concretas con esa equidad que hace tiempo venimos pidiendo. Por lo tanto, yo resalto dos aspectos importantes. El hecho que hoy estos gobiernos y, y ONU nos junten, y por otro lado que sea un diálogo intergeneracional, porque ahí debemos dejar bien en claro nuestro compromiso las que ya hace tiempo que venimos batallando por la equidad de género en los lugares de decisión, tenemos que entender y hacer visible que ya ha pasado mucho tiempo y que se precisan acciones inmediatas. Esa toma de decisión con las miradas desde un punto de vista paritario no deben demorarse. Y mucho más teniendo en cuenta que las nuevas generaciones cada vez más están llamadas a cumplir más tempranamente que nuestras generaciones el asumir responsabilidades políticas y sociales en términos de conducción. No puede ser que después de todo lo trabajado, de todo lo transitado, cuando las normativas están y cuando se ha trasladado la necesidad de esa construcción codo a codo entre hombres y mujeres, tengamos que seguir haciendo eventos donde ya no tenemos que hablar más de diagnósticos, sino que tenemos que abrir paso a acciones concretas que nos deben encontrar a todas juntas. Y en ese sentido yo me propongo ponernos desde el lado del escenario de la pospandemia donde tenemos que trabajar por darles insumos indispensables a las mujeres que en el mundo siguen siendo las que tienen a su cargo los cuidados, como ha quedado visto notoriamente en estos tiempos. Ha quedado claro que la pobreza tiene cara de mujer y de niños, después de tanto haber transitado de Beijing acá, hay diagnósticos que se repiten y no hay más tiempo. Una sociedad donde nos encuentra, trabajando codo a codo, apostando al producto, aportando el Producto Bruto Interno de nuestros países, habiéndonos formado, habiendo, por supuesto, teniendo que llegar a tal punto donde muchas de las mujeres más jóvenes que quieren seguir avanzando en su trayectoria, ya sea laboral, profesional o política, la sociedad y el sistema las pone en un momento de sus vidas en la coyuntura de tener que planificar su, materniza, su maternidad, porque esto puede ser visto hasta como un obstáculo. Es decir, no, las sociedades no. llegan a las mujeres que están comprometidas en el avance profesional, político, social, a condicionarlas muchas veces en el momento de ese cruce de caminos de tener que definir lo que yo denomino un auténtico proceso de penalización Excelente. de su maternidad. Entonces, Excelente. las mujeres ya no tenemos más nada que probar. ¿no? Las mujeres tenemos que avanzar decididamente hacia los lugares que nos corresponden. Y en ese sentido, el escenario post-pandemia nos está convocando, sin lugar a dudas, a que esa carga honoraria que tenemos en el quehacer cotidiano que implica los cuidados que llevamos adelante en forma gratuita, esa necesidad de independencia económica que debemos, sin lugar a dudas, transitar como forma de lograr esa equidad de derechos, 
es una acción que debemos tomar fundamentalmente las mujeres que llegamos a los lugares de decisión. Yo además considero que hay actores políticos que entienden que este es un proceso natural. Yo creo que ha pasado ya mucho tiempo donde ese proceso natural nos sigue encontrando, trasladando y compartiendo diagnósticos que siguen hablando de inequidades. Por lo tanto, yo propongo que de este intercambio de mujeres que admiro, que sé de su trayectoria y que sé cuánto han aportado con su mirada de género las decisiones a nivel de liderazgos políticos y sociales, hagamos una alianza estratégica donde de una vez por todas se pase a una acción decidida. El escenario post-pandemia nos va a encontrar precisamente con aumentos de pobreza. Y todas sabemos lo que significa cuando ese escenario pasa al aumento de pobreza. Donde las mujeres nuevamente somos las más castigadas. Y con las mujeres, la realidad de nuestros niños y nuestras niñas. Por lo tanto, esa alianza estratégica puede empezar hoy. No podemos seguir demorando el escenario equitativo y deben seguir llegando mujeres que tienen, no el hecho de llegar por llegar, sino sí. aquellas que tenemos incorporado la mirada de género y la equidad en el momento de la construcción de, de las políticas de nuestro país. Yo termino por acá agradeciendo fundamentalmente el estar juntas, el poder terminar este encuentro con ese compromiso de avanzar en forma decidida hacia esa equidad que hace mucho tiempo venimos solicitando. Yo estoy con ustedes y sé Thank que ustedes so están en la misma sintonía. Gracias I, I, de corazón. It's such an honor to have you here and and I agree we do need to work together on this. Um and as we know, poverty as you said Poverty does have the face of women and children and the COVID-19 pandemic has made that so much worse. Um, we, as, we, as we globally come out of this, um, we, we need to work together to change this. So I'd love to get the perspective now of Helen Clark, the former prime minister of New Zealand, who also was one of the highest level women in the UN for a long time. Uh, Prime Minister, we, we're seeing research on women in leadership being the targets of violence. What is your view of this reality for women leaders? And oh, uh, sorry, Helen, one, one thing before you speak. Um, uh, if, if every speaker can write your name in your uh, Zoom profile um, by clicking on the three dots, that way our audience will be able to see um, who you are. We have more than a thousand people who have joined through the Generation Equality Forum and many more who also have joined us on YouTube. So I know we had a, a little bit of a, of a late start on YouTube. Thank you to our YouTube audience for joining us. Um, and what an incredible turnout we have for this panel. So Helen, uh, former prime minister of New Zealand, uh, I guess, uh, yes, we are all, um, we're all women leaders, but we're also just people. So, um, Um, can you talk about women in leadership being the targets of violence, both from your experience as prime minister and also um, from your uh, high level that you've reached in the UN organization? Well, firstly, I, th I think we should be concerned about what this Reykjavik Global Index is telling us about perceptions of women leadership. Uh, it's done now across the G20 countries, and it, it's showing you know, still quite a remarkable degree of resistance to accepting women as leaders, e even in countries like Germany, which have had very talented women's leadership for such a long time. I mean, the, the, the proportion of, of people in Germany surveyed who say they're, cap they're comfortable with having a woman as head of government is 41%. For goodness sake, you know, Angela Merkel has been a leader for years. And, and And only 41% are comfortable with this. I mean, this is quite extraordinary. So it, it does say that there are really some quite deep stereotypes uh, here uh, that women are battling when they're coming into the system. But what we can't accept 
is that those leadership chairs, those decision-making chairs, don't have our name on them. You know, it, I think it's really critical that we never suffer from imposter syndrome asking, you know, sh should we be there? Yes, we should be there. We should be there because it's right and because our perspectives are absolutely essential to quality decision-making and ensuring that, that you know, whole communities are represented and not just you know, the roughly half that, uh, that is male. Uh, I think when you look at how women leaders have handled COVID, you, you see that the characteristics so often associated with women's leadership really there showing what we can do. You know, the, the women leaders have shown the empathy, who've communicated well, who haven't had the large overweening egos that haven't been prepared to listen to science, listen to advice, weigh up evidence, make decisions. You know, I mean, there's just been some incredible stars among the, the, the women's leaders. And, and I hope we'll get uh, people to look at women leaders in a new light. Uh, look, electoral systems matter in getting women into leadership. The sort of classic first past the post system as still uh, pertains in the United Kingdom, United States, uh, Canada is not so conducive to women breaking through. My own country got a really quite remarkable breakthrough with women's representation when it moved from that old Westminster UK system to proportional representation. We're now up to 48.5% of our parliament is female without quotas. But let's come to quotas. If your country's not making progress fast, go to quotas. They do work. And, and many countries have tried them and are getting uh, results uh, uh, from them. Uh, for, for women, I think uh, entry into decision making is, is often uh, thwarted by lack of access to resources. And if political parties are serious about backing women in leadership, they're going to have to make sure that those uh, women's campaigns are properly funded. They also need to support women against the threats of political violence when they run, because women can be more susceptible uh, to that. And you know, what more graphic demonstration could there be than the you know, tragic assassination of Benazir Bhutto in Pakistan uh, all those, those years ago? So yes, there are obstacles, there are stereotypes, there is stigma, but if, if we just say, well, that's the way it is and we're not gonna try, that's not good enough either. We, we have to build the alliances and the networks of women and men who will back women uh, to, to work their way into these systems and change them. You know, not just adapt to these systems the way they are, but go in there to change, make it easier for future generations to come through. I think that would be my message. Thank you so much. Uh, I think the issue of quotas is, is really interesting. In some ways, it's the, in, in English, the word quota almost has a stigma attached to it. Uh, it would be nice if there was another, I liked how um, our, our earlier um, speaker called it reserved reserved seats. Uh, Hajer Sharif said reserved seats, uh, which I find to be perhaps uh, maybe something that doesn't ha create the Can you hear me? 
I, okay, thank goodness. All right. Uh, uh, so as I, <laughs> uh, as I was saying, it's a wonderful world of technology that we live in today. So um, again, it's, we're going to now to um, Ines Yabar, who's a sustainability um, activist. I'm going to ask you to speak a little bit about um, how we achieve a feminist agenda of leadership, go beyond the focus on women's leadership and ensure uh, a diverse inclusive and intersectional forms of leadership for all members of society. This is so important. Thank you. Thank you so much for that question. And thank you for having me today. I'm really humbled to be with so many inspiring women that I look up to. And at just 25 years of age, I have to pinch myself and think, am I really in this space and discussing women who have done so much already? And I hope to achieve as much as well. Um, I am a sustainability activist, but that goes as well with uh, sustainability as an ecology, but sustainable cities includes also uh, working in poverty. And um, I work with Decho, which is an organization in Latin America helping um, people overcome poverty. And 76% of the leaders in the communities we work with are women. Um, and I think that is very powerful to know that women in shanty towns are the ones leading and they're the ones um, bringing ahead their communities and helping them overcome poverty. And uh, this is something that goes across, as you were saying, intersectionality. Um, uh, it goes across all areas of society. And, and I think there is a problem if women aren't being recognized for their leadership at any level. And they're just being sometimes applauded, um, sometimes their voices are amplified, but they don't really have the actual resources. They can't generate that momentum that we're asking for to be part of that decision-making space and have leadership roles at higher level. Um, I was at a webinar a couple of weeks ago and they were mentioning how only 13 countries have had more than one woman lead and only two of them had had three women lead. So where's the issue where we come from women leading in their communities on the ground and then they can't go further? Uh, what's happening when they uh, reach uh, higher stages. Um, I, I am from Peru and 30% uh, of the parliament seats are held by women and we have elections in two weeks. And I think something really important is to see that it's our role as well to elect those women into spaces. Uh, unfortunately, only four women out of 33 candidates or thir four of the candidates are women out of 33, but they are there. And I think it's our role as well to recognize that they are in these spaces. They are everywhere. Women, as we've been saying from the beginning, are 50% um, of humanity. So we are in every sector. We are everywhere and, and we are working and we are doing things. And it's up to us to recognize those women, to see them, um, to understand what the issues are that we have in whatever sector of society we work in. Um, I'm also working with a lot of young people in different countries that recognize this gender issue and, and the gender gaps um, in their communities. Recently, I was working with many young people from Kenya who were just saying how um, child marriage and period poverty and lack of access to education were the ones that weren't allowing them to uh, reach their full potential. So what can we do to help them? And, and I'm really grateful to be inspired by a lot of young activists from around the world, including uh, my friend Amica George, who just launched a book called Make It Happen. And she um, managed to make in the UK a uh, period poverty, something kind of of the past. And there's still lots of work to do. But now anyone in any school can access uh, period products for free. And so I think there's a lot that we can do as young people. There's a lot that we can do as women. There's a lot that we can do as men um, to just see where are the issues in your community? Um, what are the things that you can do to make sure that women, whatever sector of society they're in and in whatever sector of work or in any of the roles that they have, what is it that's preventing them from reaching her uh, levels of power and of influence? And, and women are there, um, but right now they're at the stage of where they're just being applauded. And now it's time to make it normal. Why are not young men seeing these young women in those spaces more? Um, and, and why isn't something that has become normal? I think the fact that we're all here today demonstrates that women are in positions of power, but now are we really being listened to 
is what we're saying really being taken into account. And um, that's what I think we should now work towards is recognizing that women are reaching certain positions, but they're still an exception. And we, we don't want it to be that way. Um, so I would challenge all of those of you listening. <laughs> Thank you. Christine. No, I, I, I'm, I, 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 you're, you're doing great. And uh, I want to, I agree so much with what you're saying um, that not only is it, do we need a seat at the table, but we need to be heard and listened to when we get there. Um, and I, I don't want to cut you off. I'm, I'm, uh, I want to respond to what you're saying because uh, I myself have been cut off and not heard. And it's hard to believe for, for some people watching, but um, you can accomplish a lot and still uh, not be heard frequently. Uh, I also really appreciated what you had to say about period poverty. I myself in my third decade of working find that there's no, no easier way to freeze one of your male colleagues than by suggesting that there be free tampons in the bathroom. But um, that still is not the case in many places. Uh, and, and as we know, period poverty has more serious consequences um, than in our, 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 our New York office buildings. Um, oh, I would love to be able to have time to come back to everybody um, once we've gone through our 10 panelists. We're, we're more than halfway through. So thank you everybody for, for sticking to the time. Um, and next I'd like to, to follow up on a point that you made about percentages and parity in leadership uh, with Carmen Calvo, who is the vice president of Spain. I'd, I'd like to ask you, we still have only 25%. Um, from your experience, what will work to achieve parity? And, and should quota be mandatory um, as, as um, Helen did, what should we do about quotas? Thank you. Gracias, Christy. Y es un placer enorme compartir con, con todas vosotras este espacio de reflexión y de trabajo. Y os mando un saludo grande desde mi país. Eh, yo creo que estamos hablando de mujeres de distintas edades, desde diversos lugares del mundo, y deberíamos de mandar un saludo al viento de agradecimiento a las mujeres que a lo largo de la historia han hecho esfuerzos enormes por abrir paso con caminos muy difíciles a, al liderazgo de las mujeres, a la presencia influyente de las mujeres en todos los ámbitos de la vida. Eh, creo que eh, las sociedades eh, sexistas que, que siguen discriminando a las mujeres en todos los lugares del mundo, eh, con mucha frecuencia se olvidan de nuestra historia, eh, siempre que estamos una de nosotras, casi siempre ha habido otra antes. Tenemos que agradecerlo porque eso nos hace más fuerte, nos hace mucho más confortable cuando estamos porque sabemos que otras también están y nos obliga a tener un gran compromiso con, con las más jóvenes con las que van a venir. Dicho esto, me gustaría también pensar que el liderazgo de las mujeres, de todas las mujeres, tiene que ser diferente. Y, y tenemos que procurar tener una visión muy actualizada de cómo funciona la vida y el mundo. Todo está interconectado. Tienen que ser liderazgos que se despojen de un cierto sentido del egoísmo, incluso de los nacionalismos de cada uno de los países, para trabajar de una manera más global por todas y por todos. Y en ese sentido sería muy necesario, y lo es, con el liderazgo de Naciones Unidas, de todas nosotras, de otras muchas, que seamos capaces cuando avanzamos, de darnos cuenta que lo tenemos que hacer todas, con circunstancias muy diferentes, en diferentes posiciones, culturas y lugares del mundo, pero yo creo que las mujeres del siglo XXI tenemos que incorporar una visión mucho mejor de la vida y mucho más profundamente humana. Yo creo que el liderazgo no es una cuestión de meritocracia, Creo que es una exigencia rotunda de las sociedades democráticas y una exigencia rotunda de la necesidad que tenemos las mujeres de ser nuestras propias voces, de ser nosotras mismas las que seamos capaces de decir qué nos pasa, qué necesitamos, cómo avanzan nuestros derechos, nuestras expectativas, nuestras oportunidades. Los hombres no han tenido nunca un criterio de meritocracia para los liderazgos, el poder ha sido con natural a sus propias vidas y a su propia historia. Y es verdad que algunas de vosotras lo decía, lo decía Helen, lo decía Beatriz, 
tenemos, Inés, tenemos que pisar mucho más seguras cuando estamos en los sitios, porque si no pisamos mucho más seguras y colocamos los contenidos que creemos que tenemos que colocar en nuestras agendas y en las agendas de los países, lo hacemos todo esto mucho más lento, mucho más desesperante. Por eso yo creo que las cosas tienen un nombre, se puede llamar cuota, se puede llamar democracia paritaria, se puede llamar discriminación positiva, en español la palabra discriminación es complicada, pero aún así creo que hay que tomar decisiones eh, eficientes. Eh, eh, la igualdad de nuestros derechos y de nuestro liderazgo es justo, es una cuestión de justicia, de derechos humanos, y el no tener sociedades conformadas con arreglo a la importancia de la otra mitad que somos todas las mujeres del mundo, es inútil, es muy poco eficiente para una sociedad que nosotras no seamos protagonistas, líderes, portavoces de los problemas, de las soluciones y de nuestras esperanzas. Una sociedad sin mujeres líderes está absolutamente desequilibrada, no puede ya seguir funcionando así, por eso creo que tenemos que hacer algo eficiente y es colocar en la legislación de todos los países, cuanto más mejor, decisiones jurídicamente obligatorias. Obligatorias en las listas electorales, obligatorias en los órganos del Estado, donde no puede haber más de 60, menos de 40 de un género y otro. Yo soy vicepresidenta de un gobierno que tiene la mitad de mujeres, eh, mi país tiene una legislación avanzada que nos ha costado mucho trabajo para que nada se constituya sin nosotras, sin nuestro punto de vista. Y alcanzado ese primer nivel de presencia, como decía Inés, hace falta que nos escuchen y hace falta no solo estar, sino influir. Influir, tener una capacidad de fortaleza política suficiente para que también las cosas se alcancen con arreglo a nuestros problemas. Lo, lo decían casi todas, lo, lo diremos todas. Esta pandemia nos va a afectar, nos está afectando más a nosotras. Cuando apenas conseguimos avances, vienen crisis que nos llevan por delante. Y para eso hace falta que, que estemos muchas mujeres en la primera línea política, que seamos nosotras mismas las que digamos qué pasa con nuestras niñas, qué pasa con las agresiones sexuales, qué pasa con la violencia contra nosotras, qué pasa con el mercado laboral con el tipo de trabajos en el que estamos, qué pasa con la tecnología y las profesiones nuevas donde se está diseñando el mundo y hay muy pocas mujeres en esas profesiones, en esos mundos donde se va avanzando lo que va a ser el futuro. Pero yo creo que es un asunto de derechos, es un asunto de política obligatoria, es un asunto de la lucha de las mujeres, que como decimos todas, no es una lucha, contra los hombres. Es una lucha por mejorar los modelos de convivencia, los modelos de derechos humanos que también son nuestros derechos y por tanto creo que en ese sentido no debemos de dar muchas vueltas teóricas sino ir muy rápido a ver cómo desde los foros internacionales, desde la propia ONU Mujeres, Naciones Unidas, exigimos exigimos con rapidez que todo esto vaya cambiando el mundo, que en la política exterior de los países la agenda y la presencia de las mujeres en las zonas de conflicto, en los acuerdos internacionales, todo eso forme parte de la perspectiva de las mujeres. Yo creo que el obstáculo fundamental que tenemos, entre otros muchos, es que seguimos teniendo que cargar con los roles tradicionales de las vidas tradicionales donde las mujeres no éramos ciudadanas, no teníamos derechos, no teníamos libertades y con los nuevos roles, con los nuevos papeles donde somos ciudadanas, trabajadoras, líderes, mujeres libres. Hacer las dos cosas es muy difícil, nos quita mucho tiempo, nos quita mucha fuerza. Por eso nuestra presencia y nuestros liderazgos tienen que decir que las sociedades tienen que hacerse cargo de los cuidados como política del Estado, lo que llamamos Estado de Bienestar. Todo eso libera a las mujeres de que su única profesión sea la maternidad, sea ser esposa, ser madre o ser hija al cuidado de los demás. Es la gran tarea del mundo. No hay mejor ni más tarea humanitaria ni humana, profundamente humana. Y además yo quiero concluir, a pesar de la pandemia, que es una crisis, 
yo quiero concluir con, con una perspectiva positiva. Yo creo que cada día somos más millones de mujeres concienciadas, seguras de cómo queremos que sea nuestra vida, de nuestra libertad, de nuestra fortaleza. Cada día estamos más en la actividad, en la participación, en la presión. Salimos a las calles, ahora no se puede, pero salimos a las calles a exigir nuestros derechos y a quejarnos cuando ocurre algo. Hace muy poco en Londres, cuando a esta chica eh, la han asesinado, esa fortaleza es la fortaleza que va a mover el mundo. Por eso yo quiero terminar con una eh, perspectiva eh, positiva, porque tengo la impresión rotunda de que el movimiento para mejorar el mundo que estamos construyendo las mujeres no, so es, much, ya, ya no es parable. Gracias. I Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Um, I apologize to our audience where our translation has not been working uh, for the last few minutes and uh, we're working to fix it. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, we have a few questions from the audience that we'd like to get you toward the end. And so, and we also have four panelists that we have to hear from. So next I'll turn it to Olga Sanchez Cordero, who is the Minister of the Interior of Mexico. Uh, we're, the, the Global Equality Forum is civil society centered and places a big focus on youth and feminist movements. Um, why are youth and feminist movements the focus of the forum? And can you talk about how important it is for civil society and youth to participate in this? Thank you very much. Uh, buenos dias. Bienvenidas todas y todos a esta inauguración del Forum Generacional de igualdad, convocado por eh, la ONU Mujeres y copresidido por los gobiernos de Francia y de México. Este foro se inserta en la historia del esfuerzo multilateral por conseguir la igualdad que se inició en 1995 con la Cuarta Conferencia Mundial sobre la Mujer en Beijing. Y curiosamente fue ese mismo año en el que yo ingresé a la Suprema Corte de Justicia de la Nación de mi país, en la que estuve cerca de 21 años, como la única mujer entre los 11 que integramos esa Suprema Corte. Y en ese momento, cuando yo ingresé a la Suprema Corte, introduje la perspectiva de género en el juzgamiento. Hace 26 años, el término perspectiva de género apenas se estaba acuñando y el término perspectiva de género para juzgar era todavía un tanto ajeno a las y los juzgadores, pero se introdujo con gran éxito desde la Suprema Corte en mi país. Hoy, 26 años después, estos esfuerzos continúan. Las estrategias específicas que surjan en estos días van a aterrizarse en el cierre de este foro en junio próximo en París. Y van a revisarse en la 76 Asamblea General de la Organización de las Naciones Unidas. Este foro es un encuentro intersectorial, interseccional e intergeneracional, como lo estamos viendo, para la igualdad de género. Sus protagonistas son jóvenes y la sociedad civil feminista. Al ponerlas al frente de este evento, celebramos el poder del activismo y de la solidaridad feminista. Reconocemos las aspiraciones de las mujeres en el mundo entero. En este foro se une el trabajo de la sociedad civil, de los gobiernos, de la academia, de los organismos internacionales, de los colectivos, de los grupos comunitarios, de las empresas, de los parlamentos, de los sindicatos y de los medios de comunicación y más. Arrancamos las actividades con urgencia, no desde la articulación de promesas y hojas de ruta, sino con la proposición de acciones concretas. Aquí ya se ha dicho que ya tenemos muchos diagnósticos. Yo diría, en muchas ocasiones estamos sobrediagnosticadas. Por eso hay que actuar. 
hay que tener las acciones concretas y avanzar en ellas. La pandemia del COVID-19 puso en evidencia la situación de desigualdad en la que continúan viviendo muchas mujeres y ha reafirmado la convicción de que sin la participación de la mujer en todas las esferas de la sociedad en condiciones de igualdad, no es posible lograr el desarrollo y la paz en nuestras naciones. La agenda global y la transversalidad de acciones que genera deben centrarse en la igualdad de género como cimiento de un nuevo porvenir. Nos encontramos en un punto clave que debemos, que debemos llevar a construir nuevas formas de incidencia para reconstruir un sistema que no estaba hecho para las mujeres, para transitar a uno en el cual sean ellas, las mujeres, las que marquen la pauta de las acciones globales. En este sentido, en México actuamos siguiendo un proyecto de nación que tiene como prioridad los derechos humanos y la lucha por la igualdad sustantiva. Por eso escuchamos a todas las mujeres para convertir sus intereses y preocupaciones en acciones concretas, tanto en la política interior como en el exterior. No quiero dejar de mencionar lo honrada y agradecida que me siento con todas aquellas que en su momento, como ya se dijo aquí, lucharon para que hoy pueda reunirme con, pueda reunirme con ustedes, mujeres líderes, con la seguridad dignidad y libertad con la que quiero que las mujeres del mañana se conduzcan. A las generaciones presentes les pido que tengan plena certeza de que esta lucha aún no termina y no la dejaremos inconclusa. Si es posible transformar nuestra realidad a partir del reconocimiento de que somos iguales. Por eso y por último, hago un llamado a todas las personas organizaciones e instituciones participantes a aprovechar este foro para construir un mundo en el que ninguna mujer se quede fuera, en el que ninguna mujer se quede atrás. Y compartirles lo que acabo de compartir en la inauguración. En México hoy tenemos un congreso paritario y tenemos también un gabinete paritario con el señor presidente Andrés Manuel López Obrador por primera vez en nuestra historia. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much, Interior Minister. Uh, we have three speakers that we will hear from. Uh, next, uh, we have Rigoberta Menchu, Nobel Peace Prize laureate, 1992, for her work on behalf of the rights of Guatemala indigenous people. How has this work as an advocate shaped your view on leadership? I think we might be having a problem with the sound right now. Uh, es un gran honor y un gran placer estar con distinguidas mujeres pioneras de la lucha de las mujeres en todo el mundo. Hemos tenido conquistas, conquistas gracias a la lucha de las mujeres, gracias a la formación política de un conjunto de lideresas a nivel mundial. Gracias a ellas que en muchos rincones del planeta las mujeres han construido procesos, procesos de participación política, procesos de desarrollo integral. Ninguna política pública habría funcionado sin la presión, sin la lucha, sin la participación de las mujeres. Pero también ningún conflicto habría tenido un, una resolución sin la participación de las mujeres. Entonces quiero hacer hincapié en este día a la lucha de las mujeres, que me consta 
en América Latina, en el mundo, hay grandes movimientos de mujeres que han hecho posible esa participación. Quiero hacer hincapié que no es suficiente lo que hemos logrado. Y por eso rindo homenaje a estos 25 años de Beijing, que yo también estuve allí. Y estuve allí con esa esperanza de que construiríamos una ruta de procesos que dignifique a las mujeres. Pues en primer lugar quiero saludar al gobierno de la ciudad por la invitación, la Ciudad de México, gracias por invitarme, gracias por la invitación de ONU Mujeres, en particular, quiero rendir homenaje a ONU Mujeres Guatemala. Gracias por esa apertura de ONU Mujeres Guatemala, que se ha creado la Plataforma de Mujeres Indígenas. Y dentro de esta plataforma participan siete generaciones de mujeres indígenas. Estas siete generaciones tienen el objetivo no solo de fortalecer un liderazgo, que ha existido a lo largo de varias décadas, sino también fortalecer nuevas generaciones en la lucha por la dignificación de las mujeres. Así que quiero eh, saludar a ONU Mujeres Guatemala y a ONU Mujeres América Latina. El día de hoy nos convoca a hacer una profunda reflexión, las mujeres que han incursado en el ejercicio pleno de sus derechos. ¿Cuánto hemos avanzado y cuánto estamos dispuestas a avanzar? ¿Qué tipo de alianzas podemos hacer para, número uno, fortalecer la incidencia que ya hemos logrado? Creo que nosotras las mujeres tenemos que valorar esa incidencia. Tenemos que sentirnos pioneras de esa incidencia, pero estoy de acuerdo a fortalecer nuevas formas de incidencia. ¿Incidencia de en qué? En tomas de decisiones políticas, en participación política, pero también nada de esto puede tener un resultado integral si no hay una política económica que focaliza la el beneficio a las mujeres. Las mujeres sin trabajo no pueden reclamar igualdad de participación. Las mujeres que no tienen una perspectiva de desarrollo económico integral no pueden reclamar participación. Por lo tanto, el énfasis sobre el desarrollo económico integral para las mujeres debe ser una meta de nuestra lucha posterior. Tenemos que masificar el beneficio a las mujeres. Ya hemos logrado parte, existe ya en muchos países, la, la igualdad de participación forzada un poco en los temas de la paridad. Existe ya en muchos países la presencia de mujeres en el alto nivel de la tecnología, en el alto nivel de la economía, existe ya participación de mujeres. Pero esta participación sigue siendo un privilegio. ¿Cómo podemos masificar esos beneficios para las mujeres? Tiene que pasar por política pública, pero también tiene que pasar por la parte económica. Creo que la salvación de todos está en un desarrollo integral. Pues las Naciones Unidas nos tiene una agenda completa. Y este día lo que quería yo hacer es unirme a las voces que estamos adelante para que el ejemplo de esta lucha continúe. No estoy de acuerdo que nosotros veremos el final de esta lucha, porque el final de esta lucha es infinita. Por lo tanto, nuestra agenda sustantiva debe ser renovada constantemente, permanentemente, especialmente frente a las coyunturas. En todas partes vemos 
que se ha incrementado la violencia contra las mujeres. Y en todas partes vemos la impunidad abusiva para perseguir los responsables de los crímenes. Entonces las mujeres tenemos que ser más aguerridas para combatir la violencia, exigir la justicia plena, la justicia digna en contra de las violaciones que sufren las mujeres. Felicito el trabajo de muchas mujeres en relación a las campañas contra la discriminación y contra la desigualdad. Creo que ha incidido mucho estas campañas, eh, sean privadas o públicas, o desde la academia. Eh, felicito esta participación. Creo que ninguna eh, lucha de mujeres triunfa sin la participación de las propias mujeres. Así que el día de hoy, en ocasión de esta celebración de los 25 años de la Conferencia de Beijing por parte de las Naciones Unidas, quiero invitar a todas las mujeres del mundo para que participen. Participen con sus iniciativas, participen con sus luchas, sean incluyentes, porque no podemos seguir ejerciendo las exclusiones que nosotras mismas eh, denunciamos. Entonces, la participación plena es muy importante. Creo que el ejemplo de Guatemala so en cuanto a que ONU Mujeres Berta. tiene esta plataforma de mujeres indígenas que dignifica el derecho colectivo y el derecho individual es muy importante. Pues ojalá que esta parte se pueda multiplicar en muchas otras regiones y esto es posible porque Thank ONU you. Mujeres quizá es lo más importante para mí que ha hecho las Naciones Unidas en los últimos tiempos. Muchas gracias por darme la oportunidad de participar en mi experiencia de estos 30 años de Premio Nobel de Paz. Eh, es, es muy difícil. En muchos momentos creemos que nuestra lucha es una fuente de frustración. ¿Por qué? Porque vemos la pandemia hoy en muchos lugares. La inmensa mayoría de los afectados son las mujeres y especialmente las mujeres eh, del área rural. Y en este sí. momento quiero rendir homenaje I, a las comadronas, porque las comadronas han jugado un papel muy importante, incluso en esta pandemia, especialmente en Guatemala. Muchas gracias. Thank you, and I, I agree with you that uh, the fight is not going to end. It's not, the end is not in sight. We are overcoming thousands of years of uh, gender in, in, in inequality and other types of intersectional inequality, including socioeconomic and race, race injustice. Um, I'd like to turn now to Aminata Touré, the former prime minister of Senegal. Uh, can you help us summarize what needs to happen going forward? After we hear from you, we will also hear from one of our youth leaders, Amanda Nguyen, but let's start uh, with you, prime minister. What's your perspective on what our different stakeholders need to do? Well, thank you very much. Uh, let me uh, express a little bit of a frustration um, that I'm sure will be chair across the board. Why are we repeating the same thing over and over again since Beijing and not achieving what we would like to achieve? Uh, I, I, and, and that's really the question we have to face. Uh, in many parts of the world, including here, in, 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 in where I'm talking from, uh, Africa, uh, we are left with the idea of whether we should accelerate change, but we realize that we are in a situation where we need to preserve advancement, uh, which not what we were expecting. Um, many, many of the, uh, the rights that we, we fought for and we acquired are under threat. 
uh, and it's not only in Africa, but it's uh, in many, many, many places. Uh, so we need to link our reflection to the global um, equality agenda um, in which um, gender equality would prosper. We have seen uh, very developed countries, I won't cite any for um, uh, diplomatic purposes, where leaders um, you know, sort of got elected despite uh, derogatory words toward women, despite accusation of violence against women, yet they got elected with huge numbers. Uh, we've been seeing a very um, conservative and even aggressive uh, speeches in places where we didn't used to do that. So I think it's very important that we, we, we address uh, the global um, agenda when it comes to equality, to tolerance, to anti-racism, and linking to gender equality. We cannot separate those agendas too because of um, organizational uh, purposes. Um, you know, even in a government, you have to have I think we're having a, a bit of a sound uh, and connection of problem here. So I, I'm, I, I, I'm sorry to cut you off, but we're having trouble hearing you. It, it seems to be maybe an unstable connection. Uh, but let me see if we can come back in a few minutes. Uh, I apologize for this. Uh, next, I'm going to ask uh, Amanda. Amanda, I'll come back and ask you to wrap it up uh, if you would be able to, Prime Minister. Uh, in between, I, I will ask Amanda Nguyen, the, the CEO and founder of RISE, to uh, talk to us about uh, your story, living through something traumatic. Um, but can you really focus on telling us how, as one of our youth leaders, you think women, and women leaders in particular, can, can harness obstacles that they face and turn them into drive? And then we will come back to the Prime Minister. Absolutely. And thank you so much for having me, for putting on this event. It's so wonderful to be able to connect with people, especially since for, gosh, it feels like a decade, but for the past several months, over a year now, we have been living in this pandemic. And so to be able to reach out through the screen and, and to be with one another, I just want to say thank you. Quite simply, you can't be what you can't see. And to break down gender bias, we must acknowledge that women's equality and in many places around the world, women's equality is still swept under the table. The peace is not the absence of visible conflict. In order for there to be true peace, access to justice for women is a necessary prerequisite. I am a rape survivor and that is an issue that is still working through societal stigma. You know, survivors' lives are the invisible war zones that corrode human potential, hold back the premise of a just world. And, and we, all of us, have the ability to hold a light up to that darkest corner of human experience and allow survivors at last to be seen, to be heard, to be empowered. The world is going through a moment of reckoning right now. And just as we've seen in the wake of so many disasters, COVID-19 is being trailed by a surge of domestic and sexual violence. And we know that we are as strong as the weakest among us. That's why my team and I have been fighting for sexual violence to be a priority among world leaders in the form of a United Nations General Assembly resolution, a universal sexual assault survivor bill of rights. And that's because at least 1.3 billion people are raped around the world, but there exists no international form of accountability. Hope to me is a renewable resource and we are all connected. Men included must step up because women's issues impacts them too. You know, I, I wanna end with gratitude because my mother fled as a boat refugee from Vietnam. And today I get to be in this space with leaders like you talking to people from all around the world who have tuned in because they want to see a better world. And this is the dream of my ancestors. The first time that 
I shared my story with anyone, it was hours of me talking to politicians, world leaders who could not care more, less. They told me very honestly, oh, you know, they're working on a re-election, so this wouldn't help them win, this is not a priority for them, or that women's issues wouldn't help them climb the ladder of power as fast as they would have. And at least thank you for their honesty. But as someone who was fighting for my human rights, it was devastating. And I went home and I cried. And as a pathological optimist, the next morning I got up and I did the same thing. This time I went to the United States Senate. And in my ride there, I met um, a driver, a man who was kind of intimidating. Um, and he didn't really talk to me. But at the end of the ride, he saw I was going to the Senate. So he asked me why. And I told him and this once intimidating man started crying, just tears welling up in his eyes. And he turned to me and he said, my daughter was also raped. And when he stopped the car, he said, she went through a lot of similar things that you went through. Uh, can I shake your hand? Thank you so much for fighting for my daughter. Has anyone told you that they love you today? I love you. And I'll never forget that dad. That dad, that father represents our collective story. It's a story of progress. And it shows that we must do this together. Our work in gender-based violence, in fighting for women's equality is not isolated to just women. It of course affects everyone, men, children, girls, boys, non-binary individuals, others. And I wanna say that no one is powerless when we come together and no one is invisible when we demand to be seen. So thank you so much for holding this Generation Equality Forum so that more than half of the population gets seen because we are still having our issues shoved under the table. And finally, thank you so much for including my voice and including so many perspectives today. Thank you for seeing me today. Thank you very much, Amanda. Uh, we, we have, uh, I'm going to try to go back to Aminata, uh, the Prime Minister of Senegal. Um, but if she's back on, I'm not sure if she is. Yes, I am. Oh, great. Thank you. And I apologize. There was an <laughs> issue with the with the, with the interpretation channel. So um, yes. thank you for coming back. And then uh, after you summarize for us, I will uh, introduce uh, our wrap up. So thank you. Well, I don't know how much I was heard when I was speaking, uh, but I was saying that uh, uh, allowed me to just express a little bit of a frustration that is I'm sure widely shared. Um, and it's related to the pace we are moving on gender issues. And sometimes you have the feeling that we, should, we are not moving as fast as we should. So the question should be, why is it that? Um, and one of the answer um, I'm, I'm trying to put on the table is that maybe uh, we need to further link the gender equality agenda to the bigger agenda about equality per se and tolerance and, 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 and fight against racism and discrimination. Um, because what we have witnessed in the past, I would say five to six years, I don't want to cite any country. We have seen um, from very sophisticated country, leaders insulting women and yet get, get elected. Uh, we have seen leaders uh, being very derogatory to people living with handicap or being racist, yet they would gather huge number uh, of votes. So why is it that? So we cannot um, you know, prevent ourselves from questioning um, the environment, the international environment or local environment that we are operating our program related to gender equality. I think that effort to link the fight for gender equality to other uh, struggle for equality per se uh, needs to be further enhanced. Uh, the other um, uh, point I would like to put on the table is how can we be strategic to get the, the changes faster that we want? Um, here in Senegal and in Africa, 70% of the population is below the age of 35. Uh, here in Senegal, the past days, you have heard that over the news, we face a youth riot, very violent one, um, and they came out as in big numbers because they're overwhelming when you look into the demographics. So if women who are more than half of the population, I mean, in Africa at least, 
a plus youth who are 70%, 70% of the population, why aren't we able to build alliances that would be able to win a position, political position, and make the changes we want? And we, these are both uh, two groups who have direct interest in changing um, you know, the, the, the patriarchal system that is discriminating women and young people. So that has to be reflected. That's why I salute the, the spirit of this forum. And I, I guess that's also the attempt of uh, linking both agenda of women and, and youth. I think it's vital if we want to accelerate uh, the, the, the progresses. And the last point I like what I want to make is um, we have moved in many, many, many fronts. In Senegal, 78% of the parliament is made of women. Um, after, 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 after Rwanda, more than 50, I think there are 53, uh, South Africa. But yet, the changes don't necessarily reach the most vulnerable women. It's captured by privileged women like me and others. Um, so how are we going to make sure that we have a good intersection uh, between gender equality, social equality, of course, race equality, we, we, we say that in the literature and in theory, I'm not very sure we're delivering that in, in, in program and in effectiveness. So that is also something we need to, to look at. And the last point I like to, 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 to talk about is how are we going to make sure that we make the necessary progress, needed program, progress in the context of COVID when it is about access to resources. I think it is going to be a key battle for the gender equality agenda. So more than ever, we have to come back and question the budgets at, um, that are being voted by parliament, the allocation for uh, gender equality and women related um, activities and needs and rights. I think in this context of COVID where all budgets are being cut, it's very, very important that we do so. So my final word would be, if we want to, if we are able to put together a group that can win election everywhere, then we will be able to make the changes. And for me, it's really uh, looking into um, an alliance internationally, locally, you know, uh, between women and, and young people and setting, um, you know, our electoral list rights and, 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 and taking over. I think that's the best way to move forward. Thank you. Thank you. And what an excellent summary. You, you really uh, put it all together. Uh, now I'd like to introduce uh, Fumzile Mlambo Nguka, who is the executive director of UN Women, who has done so much as an advocate for the rights of women and girls around the world. She has some closing remarks for us. Um, and then after we hear from Fumzile, we will ask our youth leaders, our three youth leaders on the panel, for one sentence uh, for their uh, summary um, and inspiration for us. So this will give you time to prepare. prepare. Uh, thank you, Fumzile, for being with us today. And the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Madam Moderator, for keeping us uh, on track. Thank you to everybody who has tuned in. I I'm coming in from Mexico, where we have uh, just opened uh, the forum. It's been wonderful to listen to, to all of you. Uh, we are having this forum just after the Commission on the Status of Women, which also focused on the theme of women's leadership and participation. And the nations of the world at CSW called for and committed to effective and equal participation of women. They even called for 50-50 representation of women in all decision-making bodies, not just in the public sector, but even beyond the public sector. They also called for participation by young women and women with disabilities. They also said it is a right for women to participate in the governing of their own countries. I think we have to be holding them accountable, supporting them to make this happen, 
and taking our rightful role in pushing for the implementation of these very strong recommendation. As Vice President Kamala Harris said, women actually enhance democracy when they, they participate because democracy is not quite a, a, what it should be when some of those whose decisions and lives, I mean, who are affected by the decisions that are taken without them being in the decision-making uh, uh, process uh, are just left unchallenged. So this is our chance to challenge the absence of women in decision-making bodies, as well as to support the way forward that will make sure that women are adequately represented. It's been wonderful to hear some of the very concrete uh, statements that you have made about what women's leadership uh, means, what women's leadership needs for indigenous women, for young women, and also what the responsibility uh, of those of us who are in position is in order to make sure that we are not the first and the last in the positions that uh, we are in, but we are rather a door openers for others to take. Generation equality is about action. We want to mark an era where we are not only talking and making statements, but we are committing to action. So in the context of leadership uh, and participation of women, the Action Coalition on Feminist Movement and Leadership has to be our hope to make sure that what we are discussing here, what has been said by CSW is acted upon and it becomes actions. We cannot only hope because hope is not a strategy. Hope becomes meaningful when it is acted upon and action coalitions are there to make sure that the hope that we rightfully have is converted into a strategy that we uh, implement. We also are in an era in generation equality where we are fostering allyship. That is why we are so broad. We have women, we have uh, corporations, we have philanthropies, we have academics, we have member states, we have the UN, we are a broad force and we are allies. We also want investments. That is why we have calculated every action that we take. We have calculated what it would cost to implement it. And we're asking and demanding that someone else pay for what needs to be done. We are an action oriented uh, movement because we also are concerned about time frames. because in the last 25 years, progress has been slow and we are done talking. We want pace, we want speed, and we want to make sure that by the time we reach 2030, we have made a difference. And I will not end by not highlighting the issue of violence against women, which is everywhere. Women who are standing for leadership position suffer intimidation, physical violence, cyber bullying, and they suffer together with their families. And that reduces the appetite that women have for leadership. And that has to end. Young women are also kept out of position because of age limitation. We have to address that because that too frustrates with young women and it kicks women out of leadership. We also heard from Crown Princess Mary about the fact that every woman deserves the position that they have. We must make sure that it is understood that women's participation and leadership is not a favor, nor is it revolutionary. It's a baseline. It's where we start. It's good corporate governance. And in many bodies where people are not represented, when decisions about them are being taken, this would not be acceptable. So we should go forward and of course,
take into account the intersection which has been highlighted so able by uh, Prime Minister Aminita who highlights the need for us to work together with all the other causes that are fighting for rights. And that is also what generation equality is about. So we are starting and we are unstoppable. And I thank you so much for giving us these rich deliberations in this section. Thank you. Thank you, Kile, uh, such incredible words. Uh, I wanna follow up on uh, your mention of opening doors and paying it forward and open the door for one sentence each, hopefully to sum up. We know you have a lot more to say, but one sentence, if you can, um, Hajer Sharif, um, uh, uh, for what, what, what should inspire us all today? It, it's, it's a question. And my question is, why are we still accepting decision-making processes that do not look like us? Simply why? Thank you. Um, Inez Yabar. Mine is an encouragement um, to all the women listening to us. Um, people are in leadership because they are technically able and women are technically able. So no dream is too big and nothing is too big in terms of setting a standard for yourself and becoming the leader. And um, it's a challenge to men to let us be those leaders. Thank you. Amanda Nguyen. Unstoppable. Zile, that, that really resonated with me. So I just want to say I am hopeful and that there is nothing that we can't do together. Um, and now uh, I want to thank everybody for, for joining us. For some of us, it's nighttime. For others, it's the middle of the day and others, it's morning. This really has been a global panel. Um, is there anybody else before we sign off um, uh, who has one sentence to summarize our action that is needed uh, or uh, a question, uh, what is happening? Okay. What's, uh, gonna, what's, go gonna, what's gonna be next? <laughs> <laughs> uh, good question. Um, so I do want to thank all of our, our speakers and panelists today. Um, I'm, I, I'm, I know that we all have a lot of action to do and there is so much more to discuss in the coming days uh, at the forum um, as, as this group comes together virtually. So, um, so thank you so much. I look forward to the coming conversations and uh, look forward to seeing and or meeting all of you in person. I hope sometime soon. It's really been a pleasure. Thank you for bearing with us through technical difficulties and, um, and uh, I very much uh, feel the call to action that you've all, that you've all asked us for today. Um, that's our obligation and our privilege to be able to meet that call to action. So thank you. Thank you, thank you. De un siglo a otro, pasamos de demostrar que podemos liderar a demostrar okay. que tenemos que liderar y formar parte de todas las decisiones a las que nos enfrentamos en este mundo.